Welcome back. Miami City Commissioner Ken Russell was running for the U.S. Senate, challenging Val Demings to be the Democratic nominee to run against Marco Rubio in November. But last week he dropped out of that race and is now running for Congress against Republican Maria Elvira Salazar. But he will almost certainly face a challenger, as County Commissioner Eileen Higgins has said she'll be getting into the race as well for the Democratic nomination. I asked Russell why he's running. Well, thank you, Jim. I want to continue the work that I've been doing in this part of Florida for the last seven years as a city commissioner, where I wish I had a federal representative helping me with the layers of government that should be working together. And I'm talking about issues like affordable housing, um, infrastructure, sea level rise, storm surge issues. These are the big problems that cities are facing and the federal government's been absent. So why do you think you'd be a more effective legislator than uh, the current Congresswoman, Maria Elvira Salazar? Well, for one, we're on the opposite side of nearly everything that we as Floridians care about. Um, this is a very important seat uh, and a very crucial district that should be leading the country on these issues, uh, yet we're lagging behind. And so we've got a Congresswoman who is too busy with culture wars to actually tackle the problems of our residents. So let's talk about, obviously, the news this week is the leak of the draft opinion that shows the Supreme Court will be overturning Roe versus Wade. What's your reaction to that? And what do you believe the next steps should be both in the state of Florida and in Congress? Well, abortion is still safe and legal for this moment. And, and this decision or this leak is causing such alarm across the country. I just came from a rally downtown at the Freedom Tower where women are afraid for their ability to make choices about their bodies. Things that they thought were enshrined or protected are held by the checks and balances of our Supreme Court. And we're seeing those checks and balances fail. It's never been more apparent how important every single vote is as we look back six years ago to the votes that put a president in office, that put Supreme Court justices in place that have made this decision possible. The only check and balance available to us left is the legislature. And that's why I'm running to be a part of a team that will hold on to women's rights at the federal level so states cannot play games with it. So let's be clear. Explain to me what exactly is your position when it comes to abortion? I believe a woman should have the right to choose what she does with her body, period. It is between she and her doctor, and that is their private decision. I don't believe that the government, nor male legislators especially, should be taking part. In fact, I believe male legislators who want to have a decision-making ability in whether a child comes into this world should do exactly what I did, which is get a, get a vasectomy. That's it. There are a number of other issues, obviously, in this race, uh, most of which involve the economy. We're going through, we're seeing a great deal of inflation right now. Gas prices are high. Food prices are going up. Uh, the Fed has increased interest rates. At the same time, unemployment has come down. What do you believe the current state of our economy is? You know, People in Washington are completely out of touch with local residents and what they're going through. These culture wars over global inflation and who they can blame it on is not what people are dealing with at the local level. The issue is rent. Rent is too damn high. People cannot afford a place to live. And I've been traveling the state for the last 10 months. I've seen there is not even a rural community where folks can afford to pay their rent anymore. There's no place to run. And we are seeing this crisis in Florida more than anywhere else and in South Florida more than anywhere in the entire country where it is the least affordable place to live. So these are the things we need to solve. And it's not about arguing about gas prices. It is about making sure we have jobs that pay good wages and rent uh, that is affordable. So how do you achieve that when it comes to rent that is affordable? Well, I've been doing it at the city level, at the municipal level with no help from the federal government, creating hundreds of millions of dollars in affordable housing dollars without raising taxes. Uh, creating zoning rules and ordinances that allow and incentivize developers to create the affordable housing that we need. You'll hear the renters just crying and begging for things like rent control, but there is an answer where we can work hand in glove with the, with the entities that are building housing in order to give them the incentives that will create rent caps through cooperation with development. And then we can create thousands of new units of truly affordable and workforce housing. I did it in Miami. I wrote the state's first ever municipal inclusionary zoning ordinance that mandates rent caps within a district of downtown. But I did it with the cooperation of development. In your video making the announcement that you were leaving the Senate race to run 
for this congressional seat. You talked about Democrats uniting, coming together, not wanting to go negative against Val Demings or, or anything along that line, and you got into this race. Let me just ask you, why should Democrats rally around you versus Eileen Higgins, who represents more people, has also been involved in the struggle for fair wages and living wages across this county, particularly at the airport? Why do you believe you're a better candidate and a better fit for this district than Eileen Higgins? Well, right now I'm the only candidate. I've actually filed my paperwork and declared that I'm running and I'm in this race. I'm the only uh, elected Democrat with experience who's running against Muddy Elvira Salazar. Well, wait a second. You, you and I both know that Eileen Higgins is running. Uh, her campaign manager announced that he would be, that she would be filing. She, I think even you knew that when you announced that she was going to be getting into the race as well. So why, why just make the decision to jump into a competitive, what will be a competitive primary now, as opposed to staying in the Senate race and galvanizing support around Eileen Higgins to take on Maria Vera Salazar? Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm good friends with Eileen Higgins. We've worked together in overlapping city and county districts uh, for several years now, and we're very aligned on issues. Um, she's very needed at the county. The Herald wrote about this just yesterday, uh, where her role there is very pivotal. I've been the chair as a team player for the Florida Democratic Party on the Board of Trustees, and I created a municipal victory program across this state to help Democrats run for office and get into good seats. We worked with Eileen on her reelection. It's very important the role that she plays there on that county commission, and her absence would be very, very noted. So I don't say this uh, as, as a, as a as an opponent, I say this as a coworker uh, at the local municipal level. I'm termed out this year. Uh, this is exactly the time for me to do this and move to a level where I can help all of the municipalities, 412 across this state through legislation, funding and regulation to achieve the things we need, the things that we really need at a local level. And I look forward to continue working with Eileen Higgins. Um, but to my knowledge, she has not officially declared and she has not filed her papers uh, so until that happens, I won't consider her a primary opponent. You know, the news cycle moves so fast. Your announcement, uh, leaving the Senate race, you jumping into the congressional race, the Roe versus Wade decision. You know, it's hard to forget that, uh, or it's easy to forget that just a few days ago, you were the pivotal vote on the soccer stadium and that deal with uh, the Beckham group, the Moss group, uh, for the use of Mel Reese Park. Uh, you believe you got a good deal. Tell me why you think that was in the best interest of city residents for you to agree to a 99-year lease agreement to give away such a valuable piece of property. I'm very proud of my decision on the Beckham deal with regard to soccer and the country club that it's replacing. Uh, that's our largest contaminated piece of land. And I'm not talking about light contamination. This was a landfill of 130 acres. Uh, which has also experienced the contamination of a golf course right on our, our greatest waterway at the Miami River. Um, I got into politics because of a contaminated park in front of my house. I know everything that there is to know about legislating and funding the remediation of contamination as I've done 85 acres since being in office and now this 130 acre site. For another entity to pay over $30 million to remediate this site on their dime is an environmental blessing to us. But that's no reason to do this alone. Four years ago, the voters decided overwhelmingly, 60% of the voters, that they would allow us to negotiate this deal directly with this group. And if you want Major League Soccer in Miami, there's only one game in town, and that's the definition of the no-bid deal. And so the no-bid deal went to the voters and they approved it, but my job was to be a gatekeeper of the terms of that deal. And I was not going to budge one inch on everything that was promised four years ago. And that's why things got a little heated this past week because I was pressured to move off my position on green space, on finances, on $15 an hour jobs, which are now $18 an hour jobs, uh, and, and good opportunities on that site. But most importantly, we could not lose an acre of green space in a no net loss policy. So we didn't lose any green space. We could not give $1 of subsidy, not in the rent and not in a bag of cash. This had to be a completely transparent and properly done financial deal. And I'm proud that it was. See, here's, here's the flaw, I think, in, in so much of the logic that has taken place going back four years to the, to the vote itself to the decision now. It seems as if the choice was between either 
keeping it a contaminated, um, as you refer to it as a country club or a public golf course, or give it over to, to Beckham and, and Jorge Mas so that they can build a stadium, a soccer stadium, along with a shopping mall, office space. It really is a development project with a stadium attached to it. I agree. Those aren't the two choices, though. Why wasn't the third choice to recognize the importance of having 130 acres of contiguous green space in the heart of the city and then seeing it as an opportunity to build something on there as a park, as a true park? Have the city, have the federal government come in, get the funds to remediate the land. Whenever we talk about greatness, you know, being a world-class city, when I think of world-class cities, I think of central, I think of cities like New York with Central Park, Chicago with Grand Park, San Francisco with Candlestick Park. Miami, this could have been one of Miami's great parks. What, see, once you made the decision, it's either got to be a golf course that's contaminated or a shopping mall slash soccer stadium. I think that was the flaw in the decision making. Time will tell and you may be right, um, but please don't forget there is a 58 acre park that is being delivered open and free to the public that will be remediated and developed by the group, but it's not within their lease. It's being gifted back to the city. So we are getting a nearly 60 acre park there. And for every other acre that they're utilizing for development, we are developing new park space elsewhere in the city.